In which war did you serve? Um, I served in the, the Cold War and then I served in uh, the, after the Gulf War, during that. the Gulf War, depending on how you want to categorize it. What branch of the service? Army, U.S. Army. What was your highest rank? I was uh, E7, Sergeant First Class. Tell me in what general locations you served during your time in the service. Um, well, I, I served, I went to training in South Carolina at Fort Jackson for basic training in AIT. From, uh, from there, I went to uh, Germany, which uh, I was promised that I would not go overseas when I enlisted because <laughs> I had a family and it was something that was important to me. I didn't, I didn't know how the Army worked and I couldn't see being able to afford taking a family overseas. So I, uh, at any rate, my first time it was in Germany, uh, Ansbach, Germany, or Kaderbach was it, the concern. And from Germany, I went to Fort Lewis, Washington. Uh, I was there just for not even quite two years. I requested to go back to Germany. So in uh, late 87 or early 88, I went to uh, Berlin, Germany. And I was there from for three years, from '88 to uh, I believe '91. Um, and then from Berlin, Germany, I went to Fort Riley, Kansas. Uh, spent several years there. From Fort Riley, Kansas, I went up to New England. I, I went into recruiting. Uh, had to do if you stay in the army long enough, you have to do either recruiting or drill sergeant. And I came up for recruiting. Went to recruiting. Ended up up in Maine, uh, right on Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and in Kittery, Maine, and did three years of recruiting there. Then I returned to Kansas, to Fort Riley, and that is where I retired out of. So you actually retired from the army. You was, how many years did you put in total? I put in just just over twenty years. So you have extensive military service. Uh, can you tell me the uh, how you enlisted, uh, what year it was, and mm -hmm. why you decided to join the Army? Yeah, um, I enlisted in 84, 1984. Um, I enlisted, I, I, was always, I always had jobs. Work was, I didn't enlist for, for work. And I think I, might, I was different than most people at that time, because although I might have been 21 at the time, I always thought about the work I was doing. This is something I want to do until I'm 65, you know, until I can retire. And at that young age, even I, I just I couldn't see doing that kind of. I was working, and uh, at the time, I mostly I did cooking in restaurants. At that particular time when I joined, I was working for Holiday Inn doing uh, their maintenance, working you know rooms, light bulb go out, I replaced it, little plums, plumbing fix, things like that. Um, so I joined for. A change. I was married. I had a son uh, who was two, and I wanted to do what was better for the family. I just felt I needed to do something. Working as a cook or working doing maintenance for Holiday Inn just wasn't the career I was looking at, and I hated school. <laughs> I did not finish school. The last grade I completed in school was eighth grade, so school was not the answer. So what I did is just the army made sense. The military made sense. The, the benefits, and I, you know, I'm thinking in my mind, 20 years and I can do something else. I can retire at 20 years and then do something else, which is essentially what I did. My wife was fully supportive, and so we, I joined the army. Where were you living at that time? We were living in in Medford, Medford, Oregon. That's where I was born, and that's where I lived up till I joined the army. I hadn't really. I hadn't really been anywhere other than, you know, across the border into California a few times, but really hadn't been anywhere before joining the Army. Why did you select the Army? Uh, well, I did get my GED, but even back then, retention selections were, they were iffy. You know, they didn't really want people who didn't have high school diplomas. So the Air Force was a no, they weren't, weren't interested. Uh, the Navy was just obvious because I had no interest in living on water. <laughs> they don't nothing to do with water. Uh, the uh, the Marines, I the Marines, I saw them as hardcore, and I really wasn't looking for the big adventure. I'm looking for stability. So the Army just seemed to fit. 
where did you, once you were inducted, where did you go for your basic training? I went to uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I actually enlisted as a, what was at the time a 72 Echo, which is DMOS, or Military Occupation Specialty, um, which was telecommunications. Um, obviously. So when you enlisted, you could choose the MOS you wanted? Yes. Yeah. And you still can today. I mean, it's, it's still the same. Uh, you have to take a test and, you know, show your ability. That's what the ASVAB is. It shows where you stand, what your abilities are. Um, so I enlisted at 72 Echo. I thought, you know, this is something that's fairly calm. It's not going to get all crazy. Marine style, you know. Um, so I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina for my basic training. And uh, from there I went to uh, Fort Gordon, Georgia, which is where the signal school was. And that's where I did my, my job training, my AIT. What was your basic training like at Fort Jackson? My basic training, it, it actually was, I was uh, a, a little disappointed. It was challenging, to be sure. But because I was 21, uh, I tended to get, most of the kids are 17, 18 years old. And so I tended to get picked for, like I was a staff duty driver, um, which meant, uh, I believe it was like one night every two weeks I spent up with the staff duty officer and I drove him or it came to the point where I was driving myself going around to all the ranges to make sure they were locked. You know, so basic training was a challenge. I got into physical shape for sure, but I also felt that I kind of missed a little bit because I, they didn't push me as like they did the younger kids. Maybe I didn't need it, I don't know, but I, I like the idea of keeping them low anyway. So. <laughs> How long was basic training? Basic training was eight weeks. Eight weeks, yeah. And still is, yeah. Uh, so after your eight weeks at Fort Jackson, you went to Fort Gordon for uh, to signal school. How long was that training? That was, if I remember right, I believe it was 10 or, 10 or 11 weeks. And what did they teach you there? Um, well, as a, I was a teletype operator, so it was a lot of typing. And it, what my job was, the best way to explain what they taught was to tell what the job was. I would take messages that would come from the field. My job was to take those messages that would come in, in whatever format they were, just someone that wrote out, you know, there was a traffic accident at this intersection or, or what, what have you. And I had to convert it to the proper format and then transmit it to where it needed to go. Um, and there was a specific format that you had to use. So that's Is really... Is that where you learned to use a teletype machine? Right. That's where I, and my typing skills improved dramatically. You, to pass, oh, you had to, I think you had to type 27 words a minute. That's what the final, but that 27 words a minute wasn't just taking a, a paper and typing it. You had to, you got your paper and then you had to convert it while you're typing it. You had to change it to the specific format. So it was a, it was interesting. It was a challenge. After your training in Fort Gordon, where'd you go? Um, from Fort Gordon, I well, I went to Germany. Um, and let me tell you how, how this worked out. It was, it was <laughs> the basic training at my graduation. My wife showed up, which she, she was supposed to, but I thought she was going to fly, fly in, attend the basic training, go with me to my AIT, and then fly back home. Um, but she had been away for eight weeks, and she had had enough, so. She flew, got a rental car, and ended up going to AIT with me, which was the plan. Then she's going to fly, but she ended up staying. So I actually lived off post while I was attending AIT. Me and my wife lived in the AIT was at Fort Gordon. Right. So I actually, which was very un, uncommon, but there was no battle. I mean, my wife showed up, said she wasn't going. <laughs> she wasn't going anywhere. So, so we uh, got an apartment, and and it, it worked out fine. It's, that's just uncommon for someone in AIT to not live in the barracks with everyone else. So your wife, so you live with your wife and son off? Out of Augusta, Georgia, yeah. And then when you were sent to Germany, did you take your family with you? No, when I went to Germany, you, you, you couldn't take your family with you. Um, you didn't have housing available. You had to go there, um, get your assignment, and then find housing for your family, for you and your family. That took, I went to Germany, um, I believe in September or August. No, I went to Germany in June. In June, I went to Germany. What year was that? That was 84. When I got my wife over there, 
shortly after Thanksgiving. It, it took three, four months. Where to, in Germany were you located? I was, I was actually assigned to uh, Kaderbach, Germany. It's a, a heliport. Um, I was in a military intelligence battalion because the job I had required uh, uh, sensitive information. I had to have a security clearance and, and so on. And so I worked in the military intelligence battalion doing the messaging. Um, and when I did my clearance, I had to have a top secret clearance for the job that I was doing. And they give you what's called an interim while they're doing the investigation. The investigation can take a year. It's, it'll take at least six months. So before I joined the Army, and I didn't know the job I picked required a, a special security clearance, but before I joined the Army, when I, when I turned 18, I had my record expunged because I did some stupid little things when I was 16, 15, 16 years old. And my record was expunged. So when I did my security clearance, filled out the paperwork for that, I... Uh, I didn't tell him about that stuff I did when I was a kid, because expunged, I thought, man, it's gone. No one can see it. His history, it's burned or whatever. Um, but come to find out, little by little, after I'm in Germany doing my, my job, the special investigator comes to see me several times, you know, with one little piece of information or this little piece of information. Um, and they, they knew about the stuff that I did when I was younger. So I, they took away my clearance. They said, we, we're, gonna, we're not taken away because of what you did. We're taken away because you didn't tell us about it. Uh, I didn't think it was there to tell you. But. So at that point, I was moved from the, from the intelligence battalion to the aviation battalion, or aviation brigade. It was a brigade. Uh, I was moved to the aviation brigade headquarters, and I worked there for the rest of that three years in Germany. I worked in the supply, and I was the armor. I did eventually get my clearance back. I just had to prove that I was worthy, I guess. <laughs> what were your duties? So how long were you actually in um, the military intelligence before they moved you? I was probably, uh, well, my wife was there. She had already gotten there. I was probably there six months. In that six months, what was what did you do? What were your duties? Well, we had a. I was in a a a. Uh, I guess you'd say a signal platoon, and we had a vehicles that that had all the equipment we needed in order to do our messaging. Um, we go to the field, and essentially, I I do the messaging that I'm supposed to do. The messages would come in. I would resubmit them and they go out. Everything from, you, you're in the field doing field exercise, doing training, so you get the training messages, you know, three KIA, you know, describing the event and so on, and, and submitting that to where it needs to go, brigade or division or what have you. And at the same time, you're also getting messages that are real, you know, you, maybe out in the field you had a traffic accident, a couple of big hum, oh, it wasn't Humvees then, it was the Jeeps and cut leads. Um, but you might, you also dealt with both training and real, real world instances, and it's just a process of doing the messaging and sending the messages out. It was it was pretty plain Jane. I mean, it wasn't the. Was it a regular nine to five schedule? No, when you're in the when you're in the field, your work it's it's twenty four hour operation. You, you might work twelve hours, um, but there's you might be working through the night. You might be working day. I mean, you could be working any time. Once you're, when you're in garrison, when you're back at the uh, cantonment, back in, uh, with your unit, which is where you spend most of your time, then it's pretty much a, a regular routine. Um, you come in at 6, 6.30, do PT, uh, go have breakfast, come back at 9, and then work from 9 to 4, 4.30. Um, your job during, in garrison is just it's training, uh, working on your equipment, uh, keeping up your vehicles. So, those kind of things. When they moved you to the aviation brigade, what were your duties there? Uh, in the aviation brigade, I worked in the supply supply room, so I worked uh, logistics for the brigade headquarters itself. Um, I worked under a supply sergeant, Sergeant Binger. I still remember him. Um, How do you spell his name? Binger, B-I-N-G-E-R. I actually. 
talked to him a few, just a few years ago, and he was in, in Denver, or in, in Colorado somewhere, I'm not sure where. He was a warrant officer, so he actually was still in. Um, so I, I wear supply, which simply meant I would go to Firth, uh, which is an area near Nuremberg, Germany, and that's where we got all of our, our, all of our supplies, everything from administrative stuff, you know, pens, pencils, papers, post-it notes, all that type, uh, copy paper, all that stuff, and bring it back. And we just maintained all the supplies for brigade, including the arms room, and it eventually ended up being the armor, which meant I took care of all, all the arms, um, kept accountability, and made sure it passed inspections, passed security inspections, make sure um, they were clean before they come in. The armor is not always the friendly, the happiest, the most liked guy in the unit because he's responsible to make sure the weapons are clean. And he doesn't want, I didn't want to clean them. He got 150 weapons in there. Who wants to clean our various weapons? So he makes sure that they are very clean when they come in. So, but I enjoyed it. It was a, it was a, it was a, a really good unit. It was really good commanders. I had a couple of different commanders there. Rotate it through while I was there. And now, and you were there for three years? Three years, yeah. So what was life like during that three years? Because you had your family with you mm -hmm. then. Uh, were you living off base? We were. When, when she first, when my wife first came over there, I had got us a place. The waiting list to get on the housing, the government housing, the waiting list to get into the, the government housing was a year. So... If you're going to bring your wife over any decent time, you had to find housing off post, off the concern. So we found, I found a house in a little tiny town called Floxlanden, and it was the third floor of this German house, and it was just very small, little. I was a private, couldn't afford a lot. Luckily, the market rate then was like three fifty, three sixty to the dollar. So I actually, I would wouldn't know how a private would even think to live over there today, but. So we lived off post in a, in, a, in a small house until, well, on the third floor of a house until uh, we got housing. Eventually we did get housing and moved in. Big difference, you know, a lot nicer house, a lot bigger. Um, and that's where we spent the last two years. Was, and that was just, the house was here, the heliport, the, the airfield, I guess. And then on the other side of the airfield is where, the office, where I worked. So it was a quick and easy get to and from work. The flocks land and was 35 miles. So it was a commute. <laughs> when you uh, lived on the base, um, you had your own house. So did you, was it like you did your own cooking, you know, took care of your, you, mm -hmm. basically it was like your own house. And you... Yeah, it, it's just, um, you, you're not paying rent, you're giving up what it's a, B, a basic allowance for housing, BAH. You're giving up your BAH, which is what they pay you if you lived off base to, to help you pay for your housing. Um, so you're not paying a rent. Um, other than that, it's just like living in someone else's house that they own that you're renting. You, you, you need to keep it up. You need to take care of the property. Um, it's not inspected. Nobody comes into your house you know, while you're living there. It's, it's just like if you're renting somewhere else. Um, the only diff big difference is there is a serious inspection when you're ready to leave, when you're getting ready to PCS and go somewhere else. They really check the house out. So that's a big thing. With I learned that the first time because when you do your pre-inspection with the housing office, which are the people that manage all the, pro all the housing, you do a really thorough pre-inspection because if there's anything wrong when you leave, you're paying for it. It doesn't matter if it was there before unless you noted it. And it's we paid I think six hundred dollars when we had spilt super glue on a on a on a rug, a uh, like a a, a, rug, a a loose rug, not a not a carpeting wall to wall carpeting. A, I forget with a throw or whatever, but it's a big throw. It was uh, like a Persian rug, uh, that type of. Um, but the super glue had stuck. We didn't know it had spilled, had spilled on there. It stuck the rug to the floor underneath, which was a wood floor, and we couldn't get it up. And when they got it up, it pulled a little bit of the wood floor up. So, at any rate, it's six hundred dollars. So we and six hundred dollars back, you know, eighty eighty seven. I was I just made E five. I just a sergeant, but it's a lot of money. I didn't make any more mistakes like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, but 
after your three years in aviation um, in Germany, where did you go? Um, well, at that time, I was due for, for a re-enlistment, re and uh, I now knew what the Army was like. I knew it was, it was a good fit for me and a good fit for my family. So, usually when you come up on re-enlistment, for your first re-enlistment, you can change your job. Well, actually, it doesn't have to be first, anywhere along the line. As long as the, the, the strengths of the different MOSs are, like, my, the job I was in had to be over strength, and the job I'm going into, that I choose to go into, it has to be under strength. And this is all assuming that I, that I qualify. So I did, I changed my job, I decided to do combat engineers, 12 Bravo. 12 Bravo? 12 Bravo, yeah. Um, and actually, I was an E5, I was a sergeant, so it's 12 Bravo 20. Um, the way the way the MOSs work or the jobs work is, the higher your rank, the higher the number is after the the, the twelve Bravo. So as an E6, it'd be twelve Bravo, Bravo thirty. As an E7, it's twelve Bravo forty. And then uh, after that, for E8, it changes to twelve Zulu. Uh, for E8 and E9. Um, so I went to the AIT at Fort Linwood, Missouri, where I was training with a bunch of uh, privates as a sergeant to be a combat engineer. And the drill sergeants really didn't want me there because I was a hindrance. They couldn't treat me like they did the privates. Um, all they had me doing is I lived off, I lived off base. I didn't live in barracks. Um, my wife wasn't with me. I, I lived in a, in a hotel. Um, all they had me doing is showing up at the training sites. You know, because the, the, the privates would all march to the training sites. You know, they do their breakfast together. They all, everything was together, moving together. So they just had me show up at the training sites, do the training, and then I would leave from there. And what made you decide to go into combat engineering? Um, well, I dealt with demolitions and explosives, um, and that interested me. I, I was it was something that I thought would be fun to do, and I, I did like it. I mean, I demo calculations. I. I was not very good at math, but with the explosives, I was able to do the math really easy. I was able to pick it up really pretty quick and easy. Um, so I just liked the idea of being able to blow stuff up. Just <laughs> How long was your training? I believe the training was like four weeks, four or five weeks. Was it uh, all classroom training or was there any field work? No, it was uh, it was some classroom training because in, in part with that job, it includes... Um, some other components, such as building, bridge building. Um, so we had to go out to the field, we built a, what they call the Bailey Bridge, which is a bridge that can span any length of gap, as far as I know. <clears throat> um, so I did that with, with, with the, the class. Um, we had to go to demo ranges, you know, and, and prep, prep explosives, uh, C4, uh, dynamite, TNT, um, prep it, blow it, you know, attach time time fuse to it, and, and learn how to use time fuse. Learn how to use the the deck cord. Um, so it was it was both in class and out in the field. What did you do when you finished the training? Uh, from <clears throat> it's I went to from there. This this was in route from Germany. I did the training in route to Fort Lewis, Washington. So I, I left Germany, went to Missouri. My wife went on to, to Oregon, I believe. Um, I did the training at Fort Linwood, Missouri, then I continued on to Fort Lewis, Washington. So I just got the level one training for 12 Bravo. I got to Fort Lewis, Washington, and a month later they sent me to BNOC, which is a basic non-commissioned officer course, which is MOS related. Meaning I was going to the next level training, which usually you don't deal with after you've been there three or four Where years. Where was this next level training? That was, the BNOC was down at Fort Ord, California. So I was a little nervous at first because <clears throat> I really didn't know anything other than what they taught the basic private, which is really very minimal. Um, and then I was, so I was going to the school where I'm expected to know all these calculations, which they didn't teach it at BNOC, I mean at basic, at the, the basic, the AIT, they don't teach you all those calculations, they teach you very basic calculations. At any rate, make a long story short, it wasn't it wasn't a big deal. I mean, they they, they trained for their ord, and 
I caught on everything. I believe I I believe I passed there with commandants on the commandants list, so I did well there. So what else could they teach you? <clears throat> more in demolition stuff or more in bridge building kind of thing? It it's uh, at that level. It's it was more in depth demolitions because it's a really long drawn out formula. It's a seven step formula that you have to account for. What for instance, uh, let's say you're going to blow a, a bridge, a bridge abutment. Um, there's a calculation you have to do to figure out how many fix, how many charges you got to put on that abutment to get the effect that you want. And there's a calculation for how much each of those charges are. And everything goes there's everything from tamping. How is it? Are you going to drill a hole, put the explosive in the hole and tamp it? Is it just going to be placed on the outside? It's just there's a lot to it. So it does take. It was it was training worthwhile. So. How many weeks did you stay at Fort Ord? Fort Ord, uh, <clears throat> I think. I'm not sure. I want to say seven or eight weeks. And then you went back to Washington, Fort right. Lewis? Right. Went back to Fort Lewis, Washington. Um, at Fort Lewis, that, at that time, Fort Lewis was the 9th Infantry Division, motorized. It was the only motorized division in the Army. Um, and they've done away with it since then. It did, they did away with it, actually, I believe, in the mid to late 90s. Um, so it, it was interesting. but. I never understood why I was motorized. The unit that I was in was light. <laughs> we had vehicles, but we didn't get to use them too much. We walked most everywhere. Um, so, yeah, I went, went back to Fort Lewis, Washington, and, and just continued there for what amounted to a year, year and a few months. What did you do while you were there? What were your duties? Uh, I, was a, I was in an engineer squad. I was a, a team leader. The squad would be <clears throat> eight eight to ten guys, and as a team leader, I would be responsible for four of them, four or five. So what were your daily duties? Daily duties were, were training, um, preparing for field exercises. We, we went to NTC while I was there, National Training Center, down in, uh, down in, uh, in California, um, trying to think, of, near Barstow, but it's from all over the country. Units come there for, for training. It's a desert environment. Um, and we came back. We trained up for a SAPR course. A SAPR course is a course for just engineers. Um, you do a lot of crazy things. Uh, the unit went. I didn't go. I didn't get to go. I was on my way out PCSing at that time. Uh, permanent change of station. Getting ready to go back to Berlin. To, uh, go back to Germany. Um, but. The routine is, is the same. It's just keeping your equipment up, uh, training, uh, training your, your, your soldiers that you have under you. Um, Did you live on base or off base? I li we originally lived off base. The waiting list there was only like six months, I believe. Um, <clears throat> so we lived off base for a short time and then we moved on, on, the, on the base. Where did you go after Fort Lewis? Uh, from Fort Lewis, Washington, we went to uh, Berlin. What year was that? That was 80, 88, 88, maybe 89, yeah. And you took your family with you? Yes, I was fortunate because going to Berlin, unlike the rest of Germany, Berlin was one of those assignments that uh, you seem to be taken care of and you could take your family. They had housing for every, everyone that was there. Uh, you couldn't really, they really didn't want you to live in off-post there, I don't think. Um, the way the Army pays you to go to your next assignment, they pay you, you can either hop on a plane and fly, and they'll pay for it, or you can get in your car and drive. And we always, every time we came up on PCS assignments, we drove, because we were paid to drive, we, they paid for the gas money, they paid for our food and lodging, and we had 10 days to get across the states. So we would always travel everywhere we went. We would travel by car as far as we could and see sites, you know. And then when we got to, to, to the East Coast, we, at that point, put the car on a boat and we would get on a plane. Um, but that's just, I, that, that was one interesting thing about the Army. I got to see a lot more by doing that. Did you take your car to Berlin with you? Yeah, I was actually, when I came down on orders for Berlin, I was actually in the market right then looking for a, a new four-wheel drive, a truck. And when I found out I was going to Berlin, I just, let's get something sporty, something that'd be fun. 
<laughs> so we got some, we got, we bought the Camaro. Yeah, we bought a, a brand new Camaro and drove it across the states. Me and my wife, my son, and our little dog. <laughs> And then that's what you took to Berlin with you? Yeah. How long were you at Berlin? I was there for a little over three years. So what uh, What was it like for those three years in Berlin? That was a completely different uh, environment to me than West West Germany. The, the wall was, was still up when we first got there. Um, Berlin is, is a big city like New York. Um, so travel was a lot harder. You know, when we were in Germany the first time, we traveled all over. We, we, we had a three or four day weekend, we could jump in the car, run and go to Austria or go to Switzerland and spend a few days, you know. Berlin's in the middle of this closed area, the middle of East Germany, and it takes you, you have to go through a big process, get flag orders, get special permission to drive. There's a special route you had to drive from Berlin to get to West Germany because you're driving through East Germany. You had to go through the checkpoints. You know, you put it at checkpoint Alpha, checkpoint Bravo, checkpoint Charlie. Uh, those checkpoints, each one of those checkpoints, you go through an American checkpoint, and then right after that, just I don't know, maybe six, eight hundred yards down, you're going through a communist checkpoint, and you have to show your flag orders. It's just very particular about the way you do things going through there. So it was very hard to travel, but Berlin was a big city and there was a lot to see and all the transportation was free to military so we, we did a lot traveling around in Berlin, seeing all parts of Berlin, Brandenburg Gate. And, um, Were you in the combat engineers in Berlin? Yeah, I was in a uh, 40, I was in an engineer company, I'm trying to, it's, it's 14th or 15th engineer uh, battalion, or I'm sorry. In Berlin, it was just a company. It was an engineer company there. We were still in the middle of the Cold War. And like you said, when you first got there, the wall was still up. Could you, when you were out in the community, can could you feel the tensions between the communists and the Americans? Um, did you feel, yeah. um, what was the security like? Did you feel at all threatened or in danger? Um, no, you didn't really feel, you didn't really feel it at that time. Uh, it, it had been going on for years and years, so it pretty much had become a, an accepted environment. Um, I felt no different there. I mean, the awareness was there. I knew where I was in the middle of Eastern Bloc country. I knew where I was, but the, the, the threat level to me was not any different than it was when I was in Southern Germany and West, the first tour. Um, but that changed dramatically because the wall came down while I was there. Um, Can you describe what that was like? That's a huge historic event, and you were actually there in person. Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, it was. Uh, it was crazy. I mean, it, if you can, you have everybody drives over there. You know, the cars over there, like Mercedes. Audis, they're like Fords and Chevys over here. They're very common, so everyone drives. And when the wall opens up, you got all these cars coming over that are the the, the Trabants, we call them Trabies, and they're little two-cylinder cars. The bodies are made of compressed cardboard, and their top speed might be 45, 50 miles an hour, and they just cause a lot of havoc. And a lot of people, uh, Germans, a lot of them had. There's a lot of issues came up when the wall opened up. Um, the, the problems with the roads, the problems with, just think about uh, but when it first happened, everybody's just elated, just happy as can be, you know, families are reunited, there's people that had family on the east side, and, and I mean, feelings are high, it's great, but very quickly that started to turn into all these things that are going to come up, you know, well, I had land over there, I had land over here, so there was... A lot of people who weren't who weren't happy or who want to take advantage of what was what they thought was theirs. Same thing with the East people on the East Germany. They might have had property in West Germany. They thought, well, I should be able to get my property back. Um, but being an American over there, uh, I didn't see a lot of it. I, I just heard a lot of it. Um, but I mean, Did the happiness was. Did you actually was, witness the wall coming down physically? 
Oh yeah, yeah. It it started it started with uh, just they had it happened just right as I was getting there, um, right as I was getting to Berlin, and they had one spot opened up, and there were still the guards there, and they were letting people through. What kind of paperwork they were looking for, I don't know. I don't know that they were at that point anymore, even looking for paperwork. Um, but there's only like one or two spots where, where East Germans could come through. Um, and most of the traffic, they, they would come over. Most of the traffic was East Germans coming over to West Germany. I didn't see much going. What I saw going into East, back in the East was always Trabant. I didn't see, you know, like the West German cars going back over there. Because, um, you know, there was fear. What it had been like, who wants to go to East Germany? and then have them all of a sudden decide to close this wall back up. It, there's only like two or three openings. They could do it in an instant. So I didn't see anybody really going that way. Um, it took, well, it took probably a year to get the wall down. When they started actually taking it down, they were using construction equipment and they were taking whole sections of it. And the wall, I don't know if, the wall was actually, there was actually two walls. There was one wall and in the middle there's a no man's land I mean, they put everything and anything in there, as far as I know, petroleum products, whatever, to keep anything from growing. It was just dirt. And then there's another wall. And that gap was, was probably 50 yards. And they had towers. Every bit of that was watched. So you, you've seen from old newsreels, whatever, people trying to get across there. And, and uh, so it took, it took over a year. And they would, I got some video of me and my wife and son you know, chipping away on the wall. And it wasn't easy to do. Then we found where they were taking it all. They're stockpiling over in just one one spot, just tons of concrete. This this wall. So we just went there, and got a bunch so of pieces. So you actually have a piece of the Berlin Wall. Yes, I had a box of it, and I, I I don't know what happened to it, but I still have yeah, I still have a couple pieces. Wow. Once the wall came down, uh, did your duties at all change? Um. No, my my assignment was still the same. Um, we still did the same things. We still did our, our, our training. Um, when the wall came down, we still had to use the corridor, the, the specific route. We still had to use flag orders. Our, our situation as a military had to change. We couldn't go over to the east. We couldn't go into East Germany. It changed uh, my last year there. So it, it, was, it changed in... Uh, what, 90, 91, 90? I guess it would be 91. It changed in 91, I believe, where we could actually got permission to go. And I did go. I, we what went. was that like? Well, it was funny because these, these people, we were driving a Camaro, a blue Camaro, me and my wife and son, going through East Germany, seeing what it looks like, some of the back roads. And every person you pass is out working in their yard or what have you they stop whatever they're doing and just stare as you go by. Because they never seen a car like that in their roads. They've never seen anything like that. Every, literally every person. If they're walking this way and you're coming toward them, they would stop and watch you as you drove by. Um, and I guess we must have drove by an installation of some sort. I don't know what we went by, but then we ended up with someone following us. And then a pulled a, a military uh, police vehicle, East, East German military police vehicle following us. So we got kind of worried and kind of found our way back out, <laughs> back into Berlin. So, but yeah, it was a, uh, it was interesting. You, you see how people, how these people have lived. I mean, thatched roofs. That's just not the, not the best environment. They don't have, they don't have cars. They don't have. It's a. Uh, After your duty was up in Berlin, where did you go? Uh, from Berlin. Uh, I went to Fort Riley, Fort Riley, Kansas. And that was in 1991? That was uh, 91 or 92, yeah. What did you do there? I was a, a engineer. I worked, actually I ended up working at the 42nd Engineer Group, which is kind of a different animal. It's uh, you know, the army broke down, you have company, battalion, brigade, division, uh, corps. An engineer group falls, can fall directly under corps, directly under corps. And what they will do is they will manage 
the engineer assets and direct the engineer assets. So I worked, actually ended up working in the, the S2 office of the engineer, of that uh, engineer group, which is the intelligence office. And it's kind Why of, would you be in the intelligence? Well, because they had a slot for a 12 Bravo uh, 6, a uh, 12 Bravo 3. I was a staff sergeant then, and uh, I was still in that slot. And it's because it was the engineer group, so all the data, all the intel we were collecting was mainly on, on enemy engineer, enemy engineer assets. And so that's For what example, I did. what kind of data would you collect? Oh, uh, the strengths, what the enemy units were like, you know, what were the strengths, were they? When you did war gaming, you go out and... You, we, now, when I went to the field with this unit, rather than going out and actually putting up concertina wire, putting in minefields and that stuff, now with this unit, I'm actually working in a, in a part of an operations center, and we're collecting data on the enemy as far as what their strengths are, where they're putting in obstacles, we're making, making predictions on what they're going to do, as, as an in, with their engineer assets, so that we can try and figure out what we're going to do to overcome. Um, were those all training scenarios when you talked about enemy, or what? They were all training scenario. I did not. This this unit did not deploy during that. There was nothing going on really during that time. Um, these were all just training scenarios. We went down to most of them. We went down to Fort Hood and did our training. We went. I went down there probably every two months, and we did a training because that's where core was. That's where the core headquarters was. And it was usually, most of our training was based on uh, Korea, if we were to go to Korea. So we were using real, real world units, real world, you know, Korean engineer units and, and, and the way that they practiced war in the past. And How long were you at Fort Riley? I was at Fort Riley for, uh, till 97. Oh, so you were there for a while. I was there for a while. Six, six years, six or seven years, I think. Um, so like you had your family, did you live on base or off base? We lived off base. We lived in a little town called Omigo, Omigo, Kansas, and we actually stayed off base. We didn't, there's housing available. We could have got housing, but we, we were buying a house in, in, in Kansas, so we stayed off base. So during that six years that you were at Fort Riley in Kansas, what was daily life for you? Um, I would go to, go to work. And we take care of equipment, take care of our, our vehicles. We had a, a lot of uh, electronic equipment and so on. Um, I also dealt with, being S2, I dealt with security clearances that our, our people in the unit had. And make, I didn't do any investigations. I made sure they kept current. If they were coming due for, for reinvestigation, if they are coming, made sure they had clearances. Um, I dealt with uh, a lot of maps, a lot of map reading. Um, as as a senior person, that office was, I think it was a three or four, it was a four person office, and I worked directly for a captain. So I was a senior person there. So I was responsible for the vehicle, our, our talk, which is our our uh, what we did our war gaming in, um, which would amount to a it was a a a box truck like a semi trailer, a semi trailer, and when we went down to Fort Hood, these trailers would all link together. The sides, the side walls would come up. They'd all link together, so essentially it could end up being a big room. But they're all their own centers. Um, yeah. So. But when was, you linked them up, they all connected. You could mm -hmm. walk through from one to the other. Yep. And that whole mass, it might be the size of a football field, would be covered with camouflage netting. It was just, it was just amazing to see. <laughs> a lot of work went into setting it up, and we did it every couple months. We were down at Fort Hood. And usually we went down twice. We go down for a pre, and then we go down for the actual training, the actual exercise. What, while you were at Fort Riley, was your your daily duties like a nine to five? It was. Well, yeah, it was. I would go in at six thirty, do PT. Um, six thirty, seven thirty was PT, and then uh, from come back at nine after PT, go home, get changed, and and eat breakfast. And then come back at nine, and I work nine to four, four thirty. In the office. Yeah, right. In the office or in the motor pool. That's where I spent ninety percent of my time was in the office or in the motor pool where the vehicles were. Did you have to do PT? Was that required? Yeah, yeah. It's pretty much required. Of there was nobody in the unit that didn't have to do PT.
in, in, in any unit unless it had some physical reason, you know. Yeah. And it was a good thing I had to do it because I probably would. <laughs> you know, when I joined the Army, when I first enlisted, that was, that was a big question for me, you know. How much running you have to do? How much running you have to do? Because I, I hated running. <laughs> I hated it with a passion. And I, I joined the Army and was doing it every day. Did you learn to like it? No. Well, I learned to... I did. I, I liked it a little bit. I enjoyed running with the units. You know, when you got 120 guys running, doing cadence and so on, you know, that's, that's, that's fun. But I can't see these people who go out and they run by themselves, and I just don't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Pop, were you awarded any medals or citations while you were in the service? Uh, yeah, yeah. I... I uh, I received medals, you know, for, for different exercises, um, for deployments, um, of course, and then you got like the Good Conduct Medal, which as long as you're good through your, every three years you'll get, you should be getting that. Um, uh, ribbons for overseas deployments, I got three, three, three overseas ribbons. Um, the World War II Occupation Medal. Uh, that's one I was, World War Two occupation. How did you get that? That one I got a. Uh, if you were assigned to Berlin before the wall came down, when it was still occupied, Berlin was occupied. You know, by France, England, U.S. If you were assigned to that, it was, it was considered still an occupied territory from, from territory from World War Two. So, if you're assigned there, you got that ribbon, the same ribbon that they were assigned in World War Two. So, that's kind of cool. Did you sustain any injuries while you were in the service? Um, I, I did not really say any direct injuries. You know, I was never in any, any combat-related incident. Um, but I, because I was in light units for the first several years, eight years, and I only weighed 120 to 129 pounds, and I was carrying 80-pound rucks, it really messed up my back. It just got worse and worse. So. That... Uh, that and my hearing, I got disability for both those. In my hearing, I didn't even I didn't even apply I didn't even file for it because I was I was told that uh, after the seventies early seventies they weren't they wouldn't give anything for hearing because they came out with earplugs you know, and they required earplugs I mean earplugs were around before that but they started requiring them then but. Uh, I don't know, someone I had seen at the VA or whatever said, no, you need a, you need a file, so. Where did you go after your six years at Fort Riley? Um, from Fort Riley, I went to my recruiting. I went to do recruiting. I went to uh, Fort Jackson. I believe it was Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I went to recruiting school. That was, I guess, about four weeks, four or five weeks. Um, and then I put in, I volunteered for recruiting because you need to do one or the other. So I volunteered for recruiting. And I was told if you volunteer, you probably will get your choice of where you want to go as long as they're opening. So I wanted Portland Battalion, Portland, Oregon. And when I got, you, you don't get your assignment where you're going until you're almost graduated from the school. And when I got my assignment, it said Portland Company. So you thought you got it? Well, yeah, I'm thinking, well, I thought it was a battalion. And I looked closer, it's Portland, Maine. So then I found I'm going to New England. And I called them and I said, I think you made a mistake. And I said, no, no mistake, that's where you're going. So, but it turned out good because we got to see New England that way. So. so how long were you a recruiter in Portland, Maine? You're required to do three years. I actually wasn't in Portland, Maine. That was just a company. I was at Kittery, uh, Kittery, Maine, right? Portsmouth, New Hampshire. The office was in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and I lived in Kittery, Maine in the Navy housing. So you lived in Kittery for three years? Mm -hmm. Once again, you brought your family with you? Yeah. What were your three years as a recruiter like? A lot different than combat engineer. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it was... Uh, Recruiting is a sales. Um, I was a failure at recruiting, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, I, I mean, I, I put people in, but they give you for, they give you unre they give you some unreasonable numbers. We ne never met quota even as an office. There were seven in the office, 
And I met Quota, I think, once in that three years. Um, but I had made my E7, I saw in first class just before I went there. So they were kind of in a bind. They would do, they would, they try to threaten, you know, the younger people, they, they could threaten. They could say, well, you know, we're going to ruin your career if you can't be, what have you. But uh, I knew there was nothing they could do. I was an E7. And I wasn't, a, I wasn't a, an ass about it. I was, I just knew there was nothing they could do. So I did my best and I, I, did, I didn't harass people, which is really what a lot of what was wanted. You know, you got to harass these kids. You got to keep bugging these kids, keep bugging these kids. But I, Did you actually have to go out into the community to recruit or did people come into the recruiting office? Uh, very rare that people would come into the recruiting office. I went out. I had schools. I had specific schools. Uh, I had a, uh, I had York High School. I had Kittery Trape Academy, which was Kittery's high school. I had uh, I had a zone. I had all. I had Maine. Essentially, my area was the southern part of Maine, right down there, around South Berwick and all that. And I went out to those schools every day. I went out. I went to the schools. I went. I, I had all kinds of things. I did. You know, I put my business card on all the phone booths. Um, I would go, I'd get contacts, I'd put things together, I'd just do whatever I could think of to try and get people who might be interested. Um, and my routine was I would come into the office at 8 in the morning, 7 or 8 in the morning. I would, didn't do PT during this time. We didn't have a coordinated PT program. Um, so I'd come into the office 7 or 8 in the morning. I would do paperwork for a couple hours and I'd leave and hit the road and stay out to about 12 30 or so um and just i see someone walking along the street looked about age right not not overweight and and stop and talk to them you know and it was uh i really enjoyed it i enjoyed the job but i didn't i i hate bugging people you know if, i i the way i looked at it is i figured this is an opportunity for you this is what i can do what you can get out of this you know what are you doing now and a lot of times they were doing nothing but this is what you could do. This is what we could do for you. It's up to you to decide whether you're going to take the opportunity or not. It's not up to me to keep harassing you to make you do it. You know? But I, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed recruiting. They ended up promote or not promoting me. They ended up making me the station commander, which is funny. <laughs> <laughs> well, not very good recruiter, but um, they made me the, the station commander, which was my last year there. What years were you in Kittery? I was there from 97 to 2000. As station commander, did your duties change? Did you still have to go out? I still had to go out. I still had a, a, a quota, but I also had to account for what was going on in the office, who who was doing what. I had to account for their routines, make sure they're doing what's supposed to be. And I had to account, do all the, the monthly paperwork, the, the, the numbers and... It was it was interesting. Now you said you stayed at the Navy barracks. I stayed on the Navy housing, and in Kittery, uh, the the Navy base. The they have a a sub yard, a submarine base there. It's uh. It's Kittery. Kittery. I can't remember what. The, I think it was called Kittery also, the sub base. But they did the same thing essentially that they do here at Groton. They they refitted the nuclear subs. They worked on did whatever it is they did with They them. didn't have any uh, army housing. No, there's no army. There's no army there at all. No, uh, the only thing there. Oh, there's a air force base, which is mainly just reserve. Um, but the only army presence is to recruit. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, they had reserves and they had national guard, obviously. But yeah. In two thousand, where did you transfer to? Um, I went back to Kansas back to our house, um, and I went to, uh, <clears throat> I was in, uh, I think it's 14, 15th engineer, or 70th, I don't remember, it's engineer battalion anyway. But you went back to the engineers. No, right, not the 42nd engineer group. I went to an engineer battalion, a regular. What were your duties with the engineer battalion? I was, uh, I worked as uh, the I was the operations sergeant. I'm trying to figure out if I was something before I was operations. But I was the operations sergeant, um, which meant I worked directly under the first sergeant, um, and I was responsible for the operations of the company. You know, the, the scheduling, the training, scheduling, uh, coordinating, 
our, our deployments to the fields, um, keeping track of all the records, all the, the, uh, the uh, you know, their, their training, whether NBC trained is current, or what, what marksmanship or rifle VAR is current. You know, all the company's training records were under me. That's a, that's a lot to be responsible for. Yeah, I enjoyed it though. It was a good job. I enjoyed it, yeah. and uh, I deployed with them to uh, to Kuwait. With that, the year uh, it would have been, I think it was two thousand two thousand two. Two thousand two. Where were you when nine eleven occurred? I wasn't. I was there. I remember. I was at Fort Riley. I was. Uh, I was on my way, it was after PT, so it was in the morning, and I was on my way to the unit or, or somewhere, and it must have been about 8 o'clock in the morning or something, because I had time, I heard it on the radio, and I was like, this is a joke or something. So I went to the snack bar, and sat at a table there, and, and had a cup of coffee or whatever, and because they had a TV, and I was watching that, and that's... So it was it was in the morning, sometime out between seven thirty and probably like eight o'clock is when that occurred. But that was a full ride of Kansas, yeah. When uh, when you saw what happened with nine eleven, what were your thoughts? Because now you're already active duty. Um. Well, you know, I will. I don't. At first, you know, until I saw it, I thought on the radio. I just thought this is. I'm not understanding what this is. This isn't what I'm. What they seem, seem to be trying to say it is. Um, but watching it, I really wasn't thinking about, I don't think I thought about my military position. I thought, I think I was just thinking at the time really about all the people, you know, the buildings, all the lies there, just, and the idiots that were, that had done it. And of course, at the time we didn't understand who, who was doing it or why it happened. But. Do you recall what um, it was like on the base after, after everyone fully realized what had happened? Um, well, overall, a lot of things, a lot of things changed after that, it, and that, nothing was immediate because it, I don't, it wasn't clear exactly what occurred. Um, but fairly quickly, the things started changing. Um, our direction, our uh, preparedness, kind of, it changed, and. I guess the information, the information flow, it seemed to be more picked up. You know, it was more, it's, you know, day to day, it's just like working anywhere else. You know, everybody talks about, you know, water, by the water fountain, you know, it's the same type of stuff. But after that, it seemed, it kind of picked up with the information on what's going on around, it picked up. Um, but it, it didn't have a real big, a real big impact. And it wouldn't, I don't think it would anyway. And, until something came up and we were told we were doing something, we were going somewhere. Otherwise, it's just... When you were informed that you were going to deploy, did you know where they were sending you? Yeah. Yeah. So you knew right from the get-go they were sending you to Kuwait? Yeah, it was... What were your responsibilities supposed to be there? Well, I was the, I was the operations sergeant. So essentially, my responsibilities were the same as they are back at home in Fort Riley. Um, I was just doing it in a desert, and there was some tweaking the different things that I had to be responsible for. What um, was your first impression when you landed in Kuwait? The city is, it's got trees and so on in the city. Uh, sand, I, I, I knew I would hate it. <laughs> I mean, there was nothing there. Um, I remember we were all, they had water because it was really hot and they had water in these big barrels or something of ice and a lot of people were taking the ice and it wasn't a good idea to get sick their ice is not is not clean clear water that they make the ice out of so um but i i didn't i didn't really uh it was not a place i would ever want to visit or that i'd really like um then once you leave the city then there's nothing i mean it's just Desert Bedouins, you, you see some, you know, some... Where were you stationed? Did, did they, had, had they built barracks at that point, or were no. you living in tents? No, in Kuwait they had, 
they had a, where you, when you arrive, they have uh, a type of barracks. I actually don't remember what the barracks looked like. But they, we were living in some type of shelter, housing, um, while we were getting our vehicles. I mean, we spent, I think, a week or two weeks there in the city getting our vehicles, getting them all ready to roll, and then after that we were gone. We didn't. I came back to the city a few times to, to take care of business, but other than that, we were out in the desert in, in uh, they had several different uh, concerns, they're not concerns, what did they call them? They had several different areas. They named them after different places, you know, uh, New York, uh, Phil, Pennsylvania, um, cabals, that's what they were. Um, so we were at a cabal, and that's pretty much where my life was, and everybody in my unit except when we went out and do some, some different training, some uh, demolitions or some, some ranges. And, and essentially, we were doing there what we would have been doing in Kansas. We were just doing it, living out of tents and training, so keeping were up. your sleeping quarters and your offices in tents? Yeah. Yeah, they're all, all, all uh, a tent that would, uh, each platoon, each platoon had their own tent, so a tent would hold 30 people, and then the... the so 30 of you would sleep in one tent? Mm -hmm. 30 of us sleep in one tent, and then the operations tent, which is where I worked, was just mine, the first sergeant and commander that were in there, and then we had a uh, supply tent, where it's just supply and all his stuff, and it's, it's, that's all just at company level, you know. Um, so how, how big would a company be? The company would be three, three platoons, four platoons, because they would they'd augment the company with, with, with support. So, like, how many men? Uh, about 120. Did you have any women in your group? We had, yes, at, at battalion level, because the whole battalion was there, um, and we had, we had females. I'm trying to remember where they worked. I don't, I don't remember that they were in our company. They couldn't be in an engineer company yet. Um, they were working battalion. Yeah. How long were you in Kuwait? We were there six months. Six months. Um, we had a. We had a. Uh, I don't know what was going through the commander's mind, but there are tower guards around the around the the cabal. They're watching the perimeter. And we had duty that day, um, where we were required. Our company was required to man man the tower guards, and he decided. And these tower guards are armed. They they have ammunition. They're they're fully armed. They're ready because they need to be ready to take on whatever. <clears throat> and he had a he had some type of sneak and peek type thing he had going on with troop soldiers coming in. And I don't know that he ever really got in trouble for it. But everybody was activated. Everybody moved to the perimeter, and someone could have been shot. Someone could have been killed because they had people coming in to test the perimeter. But it never made sense to me. I mean, there was a lot of people really, really pissed off. But it didn't make sense to me to do. That's real world. You don't do training with live am when you have live ammunition. You know, to see how effective someone is, something is. You, you <laughs> Because you could have someone get a little trigger happy and think this is it. <laughs> uh, what was your daily life like for your six months in Kuwait? Um, I was, as operations, I coordinated the, the training. I coordinated, I, I had to keep maintain the same record still. You know, everybody had to be up on their, their NBC, their marksmanship, their. I can't remember all the different training events, but. I also did a lot of construction. I, I built a. I built a. Uh, we needed a storage place, so I built a storage place and just just things to keep busy. But it was it was really, it was really hot. So you, you stayed in the tents as much as possible. As long as you could, you stayed inside. <laughs> what did uh, you do for food? The food was was brought to us. Um, at first, when we first got there, it was brought to us uh, on, on trucks, and they served it. Two meals a day? Yep. They, no, two meals a day, MREs at lunch. Um, then we finally got a, a, uh, 
dining facility, which is just a tent, a big tent, but a dining facility set up, and we were eating in there. But the food was still brought to that dining facility. They they weren't so they, they weren't cooking, cooking it there. Right there no, it came from a uh, another uh, one of the one of the cabals was just a like a logistics cabal. Everything if you ordered stuff, that's where it came from. It just and that's where all the all the the food dining facilities were where they did the cooking. The food was good though. I mean there was, yeah. How did you stay in touch with your family for the six months you were in Kuwait? Uh, I I had a phone card. I I was purchasing they had phone. telephones. Yeah, they had telephone set up on the cabal. Yeah. yeah. Was it stressful being on the cabal? Oh, not too. I mean, at times, for instance, when you everyone's activated and heading out to the perimeter. I mean, there are times when it, when it could be, but. For the most part, overall, you know, it, it wasn't bad. It's just dealing with the heat, and I still don't know. You know, all we had was was uh, um, uh, portajons, and you'd think in the heat they'd just be atrocious. And I don't know. They emptied them, I guess, like three or four times a day or something, because they never smell. Funny thing to bring up, but that's just one of the things that comes to mind. You know, it's just they. There was really it was everything you needed was there. It wasn't uh, it wasn't uh, particularly stressful. And what did you do in your downtime for entertainment? Uh, we had well, we had uh, movies that would be brought in that would be sent. Uh, family members sometimes would send pictures, movies, and so on. Um, uh, games. I. I remember for the most part, there really wasn't much downtime. You just worked. I mean, as long as you were doing, you just, I just kept busy. And unlike the, the platoons, they had a lot of physical work they had to do. You know, they went out, they were building a, a trench system. And uh, I did not, was not doing that work because my job as the operation started and required me to do a lot more in-office type work than, than out. So um, I just, I would work pretty much from when I got up, you know, I'd work the whole day. I mean, that's what I'm out to. I might go out, you know, in the, in the morning before it gets too hot, work on the, the shed, go in and do some paperwork. I mean, that was really, and I made a few trips in the Kuwait. I had to go in and get supplies or, and we had one incident coming in, uh, coming back on the, on the highway. The highway out of Kuwait, it's paved, and then it just eventually turns into sand. It just, I mean, turns into dirt. But we uh, came out of Kuwait, and a guy brandished a gun in the car beside us. But I was with, uh, I think, two other guys, and just lifted our rifles, and they <laughs> he went on. I don't know what he was doing. He was just being, a, being an ass. I don't know. Were there any casualties at all while you were there? No. Um, No, no. The train up, the train up getting ready to go, we had a, I mean, all the, all the, all the, all the injuries that I know of through my career have all been training injuries. Um, we had a, I don't know how this happened, but a platoon leader that uh, an APC, it's an M113 APC, is an armored personnel carrier, it's a square tracked vehicle, um, and at the top, you have the driver whose head is just above, and then you have the, the TC, which is the lieutenant in this particular case, who is actually probably from here up, because he has the man, the, the gun. Um, it was early morning, still dark out, and they were traveling on a, a dirt road, a two-lane road, and coming toward them was a, a tank, and a M1, I believe it was. Coming toward them was a tank, and the LT looked at the tank and saw his gun was out the back, the, the barrel, the tube on his, on his gun was out the back. And he didn't know it, he didn't realize it, but the guy was traversing his turret. So in, in other words, they passed each other and that turret went right over the top of that tank. And the LT dropped down in time, but the, the driver, the poor kid, he didn't, he ended up getting his head crushed. Yeah. And it was a... Uh, that as far as Kuwait, that's the only that's the only incident that was before that was even before Kuwait. That was in the prep, getting ready to go. 
Right here in America? It was in Kansas, yeah, in Fort Riley. Did you get any leave while you were in Kuwait? No. We, uh, as a comp as a company, we got to go to, it was one of one of the palaces that had a pool, and, and we just got to spend the day there just relaxing, doing whatever you wanted, right okay. there. Yeah, that was it, just, just relaxing there, and you could swim, you could... It was pretty boring to me. <laughs> there really was. I think they had like maybe tennis and and you know just things like that. Just kind of relaxed all day. What was your impression of the palace? Oh, it was really nice. It was very nice. I uh, I uh, particularly liked the pool. I mean, that's I think that's about the only thing I did. But it was compared to what we had been living out in the sand and desert, and it seemed like meal time was when the wind storms would come. You know, so you eating crunchy food, and but so the palace was much appreciated for sure. <laughs> After your six months in Kuwait, where did you go? Well, I deployed with with my unit, so we deployed back, re redeployed back to to Fort Riley, Kansas. The whole unit. Yep. Yeah. And before we even headed back, we got word that probably six months later, we were on on, uh, forget the word for it, but we are getting ready to go again. Back to Kuwait? Right, but this time it'd be for a year. Well, I don't remember where it was. It was Kuwait or Iraq or Afghanistan. Uh, well, not Iraq, but uh, I don't remember where it was, but it, we were on orders to go for a year, um, six months after I got back. And so when I got back, I, I talked to my wife, and, you know, my son was fully grown. There was, there was no sense in me going on these deployments, leaving my wife at home alone. If I could retire, there's no sense in staying. So, oh, so when you got back to Fort Riley, you had put in enough time in the army that you could have right, retired. Right. So my, I had always known, I'd always known that it, I'm either going to put in 20 years and get out, or I'm going to put in 30 years, nothing in between, because the, the longer you're in, the less you know marketable you are. If you want to start something else, so I want to get out as close to 20 as possible and. There's no sense in keeping going on these deployments. It's a lot of stress. A lot of people don't think about the stress that it is on the family. Can you tell me what it's like now? You took your family many, many of the places that you were stationed mm -hmm. at. Um, what was what was family life, as much as you can tell, like for your wife and son, like at Fort Riley and Kittery, and then what was it like for them when you were over in Kuwait? Um, well, my son was grown when I was in Kuwait, so he wasn't. He was, he was, uh, he was on his own already. He was in the army himself. You and your son were in the army at the same time. Yeah, he went in the army in two, 2000, 2000. He graduated in two thousand, so he went in the army in two thousand. When I was a recruiter, that's one thing I told him: if, if if you have any intention of joining the army, you need to do it now while I'm on recruiting, because I can get you what you want. You can have what you want. It's that simple. So if you're thinking you're going to join the army, do it now. Otherwise, you're going to take your chances later. And so he got in as he he uh, he did join. Um, he wanted to do video production, and that's what he got. He spent a year at, at uh, Fort Meade uh, for schooling, doing video production, photography, and and all that. So, but uh, they both, my my wife and son, both have loved. The military life. They both love it, and they, they miss it. My wife misses it all the time. She still does. She uh, it was very it was very hard for her when I uh, when I retired because wherever you went, it didn't matter. You were family, and you had family. And so, as far as the deployment, she was home alone. Um, she did really well. Being as I was in the job I was, I was very lucky because as an operations sergeant over there, I had a computer, I had internet, I had link, so we were actually able to video chat. So it it wasn't. As bad, it wasn't as hard for her and me as it was for the soldier in the platoon. They don't, they don't have that opportunity, uh, not frequently. Um, I remember while I was in Kuwait, uh, she contacted me. She had her dogs out in the back. Kansas, Fort Riley is a big post, and we used to take the dogs out and let them run. Um, she took the dogs out, and she had lost them. They wouldn't come back. She didn't know where they were. <laughs> so she. She uh, sent me a text or, or what have you on the computer. Um, I don't remember what we were using, but 
I, I'm, what do you, what do you, what am I going to do? <laughs> Go back, put down some water and wait for them. <laughs> so I guess about eight hours later, they finally showed back up. <laughs> so yeah, she, but she did well. She did well um, while I was gone. She kept busy and, and uh, I, that was, I did all the assignments I did. The reason I did the overseas assignments was because I liked them, but I was doing what I could to avoid Korea. Because Korea is a one, I'd like to have went to Korea, but Korea is a one-year assignment without family. And I didn't want to go a year. I wasn't going to be by my choice. If the Army made me, then it'd be one thing, but I definitely wasn't choosing to do. So if I kept doing overseas assignments, I could have tried to hide from Korea. <laughs> <laughs> What was your adjustment like when you retired? Um, what did you do immediately after your retirement, and what was it like adjusting to civilian life after 20 years with the Army? Um, well, initially our, our plan was to, to travel. I, I, I had bought a fifth wheel and a truck. We were just going to travel around. I wasn't going to work. We were just going to travel around with a fifth wheel around the States. And, uh, and that was going okay. And, then my wife had to have a stent put in her heart, and we she needed to have better routine and diet, and we just decided we need to settle down. So going to work is it, it wasn't too difficult for me. I, I miss the military environment. I miss I miss the camaraderie. I miss you know that that familial feeling. But other than that, as far as the work environment, going from one job to the other, it's it's wasn't too much of a challenge. It wasn't difficult for me. I guess when I, you decided to settle down, where did you settle down and what did you do for work? We settled down at um, in Oregon, because that's where I was from. But I didn't settle down in my hometown. I settled a, a few hours away from there in a town called La Pine. Um, and I got a job working at an alternative high school, the Oregon Youth Challenge High School as a mentor coordinator and uh, I really liked the job. I liked the idea of teaching. It's something that I've always been interested in and I taught you know, life coping skills. I taught uh, planning, how to, what they call the CAP, Cadet Action Plan. Um, and I worked with the kids and, and even after they graduated. At first I started there as a cadre, which was kind of like a drill sergeant. You know, this is a kid, this is a school where the kids live there. Um, they live there 24-7 for five months. And it's, it's our rules or go away, go home. Um, so that was a good fit. It was a really good fit. And I really liked it. And I ended up moving from cadre into uh, office um, where I tracked the kids a year after they graduate. So I was able to see, I was able to see the kids as a cadre. I was able to see them when they come in with, you know, their smart mouths and their attitudes and which last about 30 seconds and see them go through the process and then leave. And then when I got into the office job, I still got to see all that. But I also, something the cadre can't do, they're not allowed to do. I also was able to see what happens with them for the year after they graduate. I w did everything that they learned, did the, the responsibility that they attained while they were there, the discipline, did it stick with them for the year afterwards? And it was, I was able to see that with most of them it did. So it was a really rewarding job. Did you go back to school at all? While I was in the, throughout the time, uh, when I was 25, I started, you know, getting low college here, low college there. Um, over the years, I, I, I got about 55, 60 credits. Um, just, what was your career goal? My career goal, well, it kind of changed. It was originally, you know, management, mid-management. Um, and then I, I moved into, I wanted to do something with, with teaching, education. Now I know that you're a student now. How did you end up in Connecticut? Um, well, when I was a recruiter, uh, my son joined the Army. He graduated from high school. Um, I left. I had to go to Kansas. My son didn't want to go. He wanted to stay, stay uh, in New England until he shipped out to his basic training. Uh, so I continued with my career. He went on in his route. And when I retired and ended up in Oregon, we couldn't get my son to move to Oregon. And he's our only son. And uh, we couldn't get him to move to Oregon. So we were living with that. 
but then the point came where I actually had, when I retired out of the Army, I didn't have any education benefits at all, none. So school was not really a likely option for me. Um, but then they passed the 9-11 GI Bill, which I fell under, which meant schooling was possible. I mean, I could get my schooling paid for it and, and, uh, and plus a stipend. So, I mean, it was well, not only was it possible, but it'd be dumb not to take advantage of it. So uh, my wife, we talked about it, and Oregon, there's really not a lot there for us anymore. And we wanted to keep a, a strong relationship with our son, be near him. So we said, well, let's, we like New England. We lived up in Portsmouth. So we said, let's go. Let's, let's, let's go ahead and I will leave the job I'm at now and I'll go to school so I can do what I really work in the education system. <laughs> So that's why we, we eventually ended up in Connecticut. We moved here and I researched in schools and CCSU, I mean, started out as a teaching school. So it was the oldest school for teaching. And so, I, so you're going to CCSU now to become a teacher? Right. On yeah. the GI Bill? Yes. When yeah. do you plan to graduate? Uh, I plan to graduate spring of 2015. So two more full years of school. Do you stay in touch with any of your army buddies? Um, on rare occasion, uh, the supply sergeant um, in Kansas, at Fort Riley, Kansas. When I was operations sergeant, uh, he fell under me, the supply sergeant. Uh, we we keep in contact. He still lives in Kansas. I'm trying to remember his name, Robert. I can't I'm trying to remember his last name. It's kind of a weird name. Uh, and Sergeant Binger, who I knew back in 84, 85, uh, contacted him once just in the last few years. But overall, I had a really close friend, 84 to 87, that I've been trying to get a hold of that I would be like, we, we spent him and, we got him and his wife together. They actually, they ended up getting married. Um, and uh, Andrew Stewart, Andrew Stewart, he went to Fort, Fort Bragg from, from, Germ from Germany. I think he stayed there the whole time. He had to do an assignment in Korea, I think once or twice, in order to stay there. But, <laughs> Buck, how would you say your military experience influenced your thinking about war or the military in general? Um, <clears throat> well, I don't know that it changed my way of thinking about war. I mean, war is war is ugly, and it's not it's not a good thing. Um, I think it's been going on for as long as there's been people on Earth, but and I don't think it's going to change. You know. um, but as far as the way I, the way I view, I understand the military. I understand the military environment, and it's made me view some people in a negative way, where I, I try to avoid not to view them that way. But there's there's so many people that don't understand the military, and they talk negative about it, and they don't even know what they're talking about. I used to tell recruits, or people I, I was looking at recruiting, when after I talked to them, tell them about the Army, what it can offer, and you know, all this, I used to tell them, you can go and talk to anybody you want, but anybody you talk to, you ask them where, where they served. If they weren't in the military branch, they don't know anything of what they're talking about. You know, if they're talking negative or positive, they really don't know from their own experience. Um, so I, I think... Uh, I don't think it's changed my view a whole lot about war. I mean, war is ugly, but it's, it's inevitable sometimes. Have you joined any veterans organizations since you retired? You know, I I don't think I have. I was going to. Um, I just don't have a lot of time. I just, I would like to, and I always think, you know, I'm going to join VFW. And I thought I did at one point, but I, I have never gotten any card or anything that says I was a member, so maybe I didn't follow through. Um, I just, I just knowing myself and knowing the time that I have available, I would join and then it'd be it. I probably wouldn't be active. Maybe a little later when I got more time. <laughs> How did your military service affect your life? Oh, in a, in a big way. I mean, in, in many ways. Um, it's made, it's made me more responsible. I think my military service, I've been married for 30 33 years this year, and I think in big part it's because of the military that I've stayed married as long as I have. I mean, 
and I think it's it's impacted my son in his his way of thinking, his life. It's it's impacted. I mean, everything about my life. The military is impacted in one way or another. Buck, is there anything you'd like to add that we haven't covered in this interview? Any other memorable experiences that you recall? Um, well, I was I was thinking while we were talking here, and I, I was thinking about something I, I probably should have mentioned while we were in Berlin. Um, I'll tell you a, a little story about a lieutenant who... And when I was in Berlin, you had to go through a specific corridor to travel from Berlin to West Germany. And with that corridor, went, they called it the corridor. It went through uh, East Germany. Um, and it's very specific. Specific autobahns, you had to go through specific points. And it was timed. They, they docked the time when you left. It was tracked all the way. So they would know if someone made a wrong turn or what have you, wandering around Eastern Germany. Um, and it, it was unheard of to happen. I mean, they made it so clear you had to be a complete idiot. So, the lieutenant. <laughs> they put a lieutenant who was moving. If we went, our training facilities were in Western Germany. If we wanted to go to uh, Vilsack or, or uh, the other, I can't think of the other, Grafenbeer, we had to go through the corridor as a unit. We, we, we had to follow the same rules. It's still an Eastern Bloc country. Um, so, we would go through in buses. Our vehicles and all that would go on trains. Um, and we would take our wheeled vehicles. We actually, we drove our wheeled vehicles because we were all in a convoy. Um, but this lieutenant took the convoy. He had one half of the convoy, and I don't remember, someone else had the other half, and he made a wrong turn. And I don't know why, but like ducks in a row, everybody, everybody up to like a certain number of vehicles followed him. And someone was smart enough to say, no, <laughs> we'll keep going this way. And it was a major is incident, and I never heard from him again. That lieutenant was gone. So I'm sure he was relieved because that was just that's a a major major. Were you in one of the vehicles that went the wrong way? No, no, I didn't even know what happened until we arrived, and I, I got the word. I was I was probably in the the half ahead of him, but no, it's just that's a major event. It's a major event if a person does it alone, but you got military vehicles and you do it. I mean that activates the whole the whole East German army. I mean they don't know what's going on. So he was, I never heard from him or seen him again. <laughs> wow. Are there any other memorable incidents that you can recall that we haven't talked about? No, just a lot of memories of little things and, you know, smells and <laughs> so. I wouldn't have traded it for the world. Well, Buck, I'd like to thank you for your service to our country and thank you for this interview. Oh, thank you.